You might think that you're recording in your kitchen and it sounds fine, but as soon as you throw a compressor on there and like the slappy ambience of your tiled kitchen floor and backsplash and stuff gets louder, all of a sudden your vocal's going to sound really roomy and awful. Yep. <laughs> this is the Self-Recording Band Podcast, the show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tyne, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flat. How are you, Malcolm? I'm great, man. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Awesome. Pretty excited awesome. because we just launched the Academy, as some of you listeners might know. Um, it's been a wild week. <laughs> like when you're listening to this, it's already a week ago. But as of like today, when we're recording this, we just closed registration and it's, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Pretty exhausting, yeah, <laughs> but, but something you've been working fun. on for a long time. Yep, it's very cool. Yeah, yeah, and thank you to all the listeners that have been uh, listening along the way, and anybody that uh, did so, uh, buy the course. Um, I, I'm sure you're going to love it. It's yeah, this is exciting. Great work, dude. It, thank you. It's it's totally exciting, and it's so cool to see what came from this idea, from this blog, and then podcast, and then community, and all of that. And uh, yeah, it's just only possible because of you, like the listeners and uh, people who, who are joining the Academy now, probably because of like listening to the podcast first or checking out our Facebook community. So thank you to all of you. And uh, we're going to open up the Academy again and you will know. Uh, I will let you know when it's time. Uh, but for now, we just keep on with our regular content as always. That's not going to change. Also, it's not going to change our free Facebook community. So if you want to join that, go to the selfrecordingband.com slash community. It's constantly growing. We have great conversations in there. Every now and then we even have like live webinars. We just did one, which was very great. We don't know what, we, what we'll do in that regard in the future and how we're going to do it. But we're thinking about ways to be more engaged with the community and offer more value even for free. So go to the selfrecordingband.com slash community. Join the Facebook community. And uh, yeah, we're very excited to see you in there. Definitely. Yeah, so today we're going to start something that we haven't done so far. We're going to start a little, I don't know if it's going to be a series, but we're going to do episodes um, from now on, every now and again, that are about basic concepts, basic audio concepts, like explaining one specific thing, one specific part of the process or one specific technique. And we're going to start today by talking about compression, because compression is one of those things that you need to understand whether you use it yourself or whether you maybe you don't use compression while you record but you still I think it's still valuable to know how compression works because when you send in your tracks to someone else they're going to use compression and you probably want to know what is happening to your tracks you I think it helps you understand why things sound the way they sound after you got a mix back for example or a master so this is going to be the first of a couple of episodes and um yeah what are your initial thoughts um, about like when you when you hear the term compression? Is this because I, I love compression so much that I wanted to do this first? <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> what about you, Malcolm? What is like what comes to yeah. mind when you hear compression? I mean, I love compression too, um, but I think a lot of people probably are glad we're doing this because I remember when I had no idea of what a compressor was, other than that I thought they were cool and that I should be using one. Um, <laughs> cause th that's the term that is constantly thrown around. Um, you you'll see it anywhere. You can't Google anything to do with recording audio and not see the term compression somewhere in there. Um, so what is compression, I guess, is where to start with this, right? Um, and compression is the process of reducing the dynamic range of an audio signal. And I mean, that's technically what it's doing, but why we're doing that might be totally different. Um, than just that. But essentially, a compressor is going to take an audio file and squeeze it so that the loud and the quiet stuff is closer together. That's really what's happening at the end of the day. So I guess now, knowing that, we need to try and describe why you would even want to do that. Like, why is that useful, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, the, that explanation is, is pretty pretty spot on. And I just want to say before we move on that don't confuse this with um, compression, with data compression, because I just need to say that because mm. I had that a couple of times when people hear like, 
a compressed audio file and they mean like an MP3 or whatever. Like this is a different thing. Like it, we're not we're not talking about that. That's we talk about audio compression, like the process of using a compressor to change the way a, a signal sounds to change the dynamic range of a signal. It's not the same as compressing a WAV file so that it becomes an MP3. It's a different thing. I just, just want to say that. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, Reducing the dynamic range. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the podcast, The Attack and Release Show. Shout out to them. It's a great podcast. It's two mastering engineers, podcast. Sam Moses, and um, I've got the other name, Matt, I think. Sorry <laughs> for that. <laughs> but like, yeah, The Attack and the Re and Release Show. It's a great podcast about mastering. And Sam, Sam Moses, the host of the show, always refers to compression as more loud more often <laughs> because, <Right. laughs> because like in mastering uh, especially because what happens is you push down on the loudest parts of a signal you make the loudest parts of a signal quieter and then you turn up the whole signal so the quieter parts become louder so all the stuff that's was quieter before is now louder and so the whole thing becomes more loud more often and sounds louder as a result yeah. but the peak level you're going to see on a peak meter is going to stay the same if you're using like a limiter which is an extreme form of compression but that's like the basic explanation of it you're making the loud parts quieter then you bring up the whole signal to make up for that reduced volume yeah and by that you increase the perceived volume of the whole thing because the quiet parts get louder yeah definitely the the overall loudness is now up and consistently. Yeah, I, and I think that is really like the that really standard definition is the main reason, or at least the first reason to why we would use a compressor um, is that we want to have a more consistent leveled audio file. Um, of I think a vocal is probably the easiest thing to imagine that on, where we don't want the singer to sound quiet for some words and loud for others necessarily, right? If Especially if it's meant to all be very kind of at the same uniform volume. And a compressor is going to do a great job at trying to correct that issue for us. Um, at the same time, we probably don't want certain noises like uh, t like c hard consonances to just like spike up and, and feel like they're just stabbing the listener in the ears where the word that comes after is really quiet, right? So uh, again, a compressor could be used to kind of split the difference there and bring those back into the same dynamic ballpark. Yes, agreed. So first reason to control and level overly dynamic audio. You can, Im you can think of that as like an auto fader in a way. It's like if you set a compressor mm -hmm. so that it controls overly dynamic audio and, and makes it gives you a, con a more consistent level, it's just like your like a finger on a fader constantly riding it and making uh, making it more consistent. That's what it does, basically, if you set it that way. So that's the yeah. first use of it. Um, vocals, great example for that. You can also do that with um, like drums, for example. If you set the compressor really fast so that it grabs all, grabs all the transients, you can um, make inconsistent kick or snare hits more consistent and control the dynamic of that because yeah. that's a really dynamic signal, right? Or... Um, Bass, for example, needs to be controlled a lot often just so certain notes don't jump us out as much and it's more consistent. So, yeah, controlling and leveling overly dynamic audio. We kind of already touched on the next why, which is to shape transients. When you were saying, like, controlling plosives in vocals or when I was talking about drums, right. we're talking about transients. We're tra talking about the initial attack of a signal. This could be a pick attack of a guitar or bass. This could be the stick attack of a drum this could be plosives in a vocal, like all these sharp, short um, peaks in a signal that are, these are called transients. And we can not only control them, like um, clamp down on them and make it more consistent, we can change the way they sound or we can change the relationship between the transient and the rest of the signal. So mm -hmm. we can set a compressor so that it gets rid of the transient or much of it. We can set it in a way that it like brings out the transient even more and makes it snappier, punchier. Both of that is possible. Yep. And we're going to talk about the how uh, in a second, but just know that this is another um, way or another reason to use a compressor. You might not make the whole performance more consistent, but you can shape the way the attack sounds. Yes, yep. So yeah, the attack, when we say attack, we're usually also saying transient. Um, 
it's transient attack are kind of the same word in that sense. And transient is a great word to know. It'll come up a lot. And it's good to think about as you're getting sounds in the studio too, is like, okay, what is happening with the transient information when I mic it like this um, on any instrument, especially drums, I think. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, we talked about just, a, I think an important thing to differentiate is that we talked about using a compressor to control levels and like maybe make the transient sound quieter or louder um but it's also like a total totally a tone shaping tool as well um like you can really alter how the transient sounds and and round it off and it'll totally transform like a snare drum for example will sound dramatically different with a fast or a slow release or sorry attack yeah <laughs> releases are coming next but think of that as the start of a drum hit or the start of yeah a sound um where up next would be using a compressor to alter the sustain of signal. So again, sticking with the snare drum for now, the initial attack is the big spike, right? Like right when the stick hits, there's a transient, and then there's the decay of the drum after. Wow. Yeah, and I think if you have an 80s yeah, snare. Yeah, <laughs> that was a totally 80s snare. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the put is the transient, and then wow. <laughs> <laughs> would be the the sustain <laughs> you enjoying this penny do you want them yeah. together now <laughs> um so the sustain is uh in this case pretty long <laughs> uh and now using a compressor though you can alter that you can make it duck quicker or or get stay um like try and make it louder even um and you kind of have some control over if the sustain of that drum sounds as you recorded it pretty much like, or as it does in the room, you can make it try and adjust it to be shorter or longer um, using a compressor. So you, with a compressor, you have control over, I guess, dynamics, but like the, the shape of the transient and the sustain of the, the sound as well. Yes, totally. And in a weird way, it's not either or. It's like when you change the, the transient, like it, it sort of changes the sustain or the way you perceive the sustain and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you don't actually do anything to the sustain, but it sounds different because you like altered the, the attack a lot or what, but we get, we get to that. So in almost every setting, a compressor changes the attack and release like the, 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 the transient and the sustain. These are the correct terms in this, um, when it comes to this. So yeah. Um, Let's maybe, so that people understand what we're talking about and how this actually works and happens, let's talk about how, how it's done. And I just um, said the correct way to, to, to call these things is trans, transient and sustain because attack and release, I don't want to confuse this because attack and release are the controls yes. on the compressor that are typically called attack and release. And um, it's not that when you like turn the attack up, you're going to get more attack, for example. So that's, that can be a little confusing. The first part of the signal that sounds like the attack of it is called transient and the sustain yeah. is called sustain, everything that comes after that. And the controls are called attack and release. And we, what, what we can do with these, that's what, what we're going to talk about now. Awesome. So we, okay. we've explained what the compressor in general does. A compressor makes the louder parts quieter and then we can make up for that difference and increase the level of the whole signal. We need to start with the threshold because the threshold is what tells the compressor when to actually start changing the signal. Like, how loud is too loud? Like, you know, mm -hmm. at, at what point should the compressor start making the loud stuff quieter? You're telling the compressor if the signal exceeds this level, you gotta do something about it. As Benny said, the threshold will decide the point that the compressor actually engages. Um, and what that means visually, and I think this is the easiest way to picture it, is if you've recorded audio into a computer, you've seen your waveform displayed on the screen going up and down, right? And that's your, your signal. It's a representation of your signal. Now, the highest peaks that go the furthest up or the furthest down, those are the loudest parts of signal. And if you imagine that you've got uh, lines above and below the, the waveform and you start moving them closer to the waveform as you go, eventually they're going to start hitting the loudest peaks, right? So imagine that you're just like bringing these borders in on your waveform. And as soon as it hits any of those peaks in your waveform, that's when the compressor is going to actually kick in. And that is our threshold. Our threshold is that 
line being brought down onto the peaks of our audio. And obviously, if you just maxed it out, all of the audio would be triggering the compressor. But you can really decide, using the the threshold control, you can decide how much you want to be taking, um, how much you want to affect it by the compressor. Does that make sense yes. to you? I'm using hand signals as we're having the Zoom call, but the listener yes. can't see Yeah, that. It, it totally makes sense. <laughs> I just, I'm just not sure if, like, because the visualization really helps, but it doesn't really tell the compressor how much to do um, or to to take away or to, but, but it, it tells the compressor, like, how loud is too loud, basically. Like, when, when, when to does, start working. Yeah, when to start working, basically, because how much it's going to work due to the signal is um, determined by the ratio. The ratio tells the compressor, yes. like, if the signal goes over this threshold, turn it down by this amount. And you see mm-hmm. um, the, the, the ratio control usually gives you options like 2 to 1 or 4 to 1 or 10 to 1. I think we need to put in the show notes, we need to put graphs in there to, like, help visualize this because if you're not seeing this, it's really hard to to understand. But just know that the higher the ratio, like 10 to 1 compared to 2 to 1, means that the compressor turns it down more after it goes past that threshold. And it turns it down in a certain ratio. That's basically what it does. So um, once you see the graph, it it totally makes sense. But it's just, um, yeah, it just tells the compressor how much to turn down the signal. We can leave it at that, I think. Yeah, just uh, there to give you an idea, because you've probably seen them and been wondering, there's usually like a two to one, a four to one, um, and then th- those are the most common, but they, they do go higher, of course. Um, and yeah, higher ratio is going to be more compression. Yeah, and uh, to m- maybe it helps under- it helps you understand all of this if we tell you that a limiter has basically a very, very, is a compressor with a very, very, very high ratio so that as soon as the signal hits the threshold, it's going to stay there basically at this level. It's not going to go any louder. It's like a ceiling. This is basically right. an, uh, the highest ratio possible, and this is what a limiter is. It's a compressor with a very, very, very high ratio. Yeah. So exactly. and yeah, exactly. and uh, now it gets interesting because the attack and release yeah. is what's going to shape the whole behavior and the sound of our signal. Because as of now, we have told the compressor when to start working, and we have told it how much to to do, how much to turn the signal down. Now we're going to tell right. it when to reach maximum gain reduction and how long it will take to let the signal come up again to where it was. That's what attack and release does. Yes. And there's a misconception because a lot of blogs or YouTubers or a lot of information out there, a lot of resources out there tell you that attack means the time it takes the compressor until it starts working, which is not true. That's a misconception because a compressor starts working immediately. The attack time tells you how long it takes it to reach full gain reduction, to reach the full like right. um, four to one, six to one, ten to one, whatever you set. So it's not like that. There is nothing happening, and then like if you have an attack of twenty milliseconds, it's not that the compressor doesn't do anything in those twenty milliseconds and then starts working. It just means that it takes the compressor twenty milliseconds to do what it's supposed to do, like to reach the full gain reduction. And if it's set to even longer times, it takes it even longer. And if it's set to a very short time, uh, it's very quick. But it reacts immediately mm-hmm. after the signal goes past the threshold. That's important to know. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, this is really going to mess with your transient a lot. Um, the attack control is pretty much how you shape a transient. So keep that in mind, and and that's what to listen for when you're experimenting with a compressor and trying to figure out what that attack note does. Listen to the transient information most, I think. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, so what that means when you actually apply it, when you actually try what what it does, it means that the longer the attack time is, the more of your signal of your transient gets through, and um, without being compressed or turned down a lot, and as soon mm-hmm. as that that also means that quicker transients and like high frequency transients get through with shorter attack times while slower lower frequency stuff like kick drums bass notes and stuff they are going to be turned down and you have to increase the attack time in order to let a kick drum through for example while you while yeah. to, for example a quick mouth click or um a, a, maybe 
maybe even a snare drum or some very quick sort of transients can get through with a very short attack time already. So um, yeah, the attack time basically gives you a control over how much uh, how much of the transient you want to hear and or how much of it you want to eliminate or sh- like mm. round off. Yes, yeah, definitely. You'll hear the term preserving transients like like oh we want to preserve the transient in this like the transient information in this master and that is referring to attack like setting the attack so that it doesn't grab the uh, and mess with the transient information too much um would be the like the goal in that case um but all of those examples were kind of like put through the light of not wanting to mess with the transient but sometimes you absolutely do want to mess with the transient so it goes both ways there's a time and a place for both of just completely altering it or trying to make it as if you couldn't tell that there was a compressor on it. Both happen. Exactly. Like, for example, with the snare drum, I think that's a really easy example to understand and to try for yourself. If you have a snare drum and you want to mm-hmm. make it punchier or more like peaky, whatever you want to call it, if you want to have more transient, more stick attack, you want to make the attack long enough so that the stick attack comes through and then you want to apply full gain reduction and if you want to do the opposite, if you want to have it like sit in the mix better and not jump out as much, not be as punchy, not be as picky or whatever you want to call it, then you you use a shorter attack time and make the compressor compress immediately a lot, which will like even out the transients, push it back in the mix a bit probably, um, make it less punchy. And yeah, and both can be desirable depending on the situation so you can make a drummer seem like to be hitting harder or you can create the opposite effect you can make it sound softer like harder and softer are basically good words to describe this a longer attack time will result in a harder sounding snare drum a shorter attack time will result in a softer sounding snare drum yeah there we go uh so release yeah i think that's up next so yeah release is how soon after the signal dips below the threshold that the compressor stops working yeah. Um, so I like to think of it as like audio goes through a rubber band and how long does it take for the rubber band to return? I yeah. think I stole that off Joel one a sec. <laughs> trying to remember <laughs> what video, but I was like, oh, I can actually picture it now. That's so helpful. <laughs> um, but yeah, do you want it to return quickly or, or slowly? And, and like we said earlier, that's going to mess with the sustain of the audio primarily, which again can really be great. Um, We've got like a lot of rock guys in the community, it seems. Um, and if you have like a fast double kick part, you really need those drums not to s- sustain very long because they're going to just kind of like get on top of each other. Like it's just like this kind of thing. So we want to shorten the kick drum in like a scenario like that often. And release could be a great way of trying to accomplish that. Yes, in bo- like, but in both directions. That's actually a complicated example because it could mean that you set the att- the release time very short so that the compressor recovers before the next hit and you don't mess with the performance too much. Or it could mean to have the release time set pretty long so that it... To shorten, to the, shorten sustain the sustain of, of the kick drum and to to control the whole kick drum part. So that's that's a very complicated example for this because both could could work. So... <laughs> if you imagine like a single hit f- first, what the what you can do with the release t- uh, time is, so you, say you have this kick drum example that Malcolm just said, you have a single kick drum hit and you set the attack so that the attack of the kick drum, the transient comes through, so it's punchy and full and the bass gets through the, the low frequency content. And then if you have a very quick release time, the compression will kick in and immediately release it again. And uh, so the sustain of the kick drum will come up very quickly. So you get a hard attack. And then the it's like you if you would turn up the fader really quickly after the attack and the sustain of the kick drum comes up. If you increase the release time, the attack comes through, the compressor kicks in, and then it stays down. So the, the sustain of the kick drum will be quieter. So you'll have a very punchy kick with a quieter sustain if the release time is long enough to keep it down there. If it's short, mm-hmm. you'll have the attack and then the release will come up, the, the sustain will come up immediately. And now if you think of that double bass part, uh, slow release would mean that the probably the first hit of that part would hit pretty hard and then all the other kicks would be pretty controlled because the compressor just stays down, it keeps it down. And then 
a fast release would mean that every single hit would like, th- yeah, you would have more movement. You would have more mm-hmm. attacks, and like the release would come up after each attack, and you would get like a really probably a pretty messy, but also pretty dynamic sounding um, double bass part. Whereas a long uh, release would cause the whole part to be more controlled. So yeah. Yeah, and you can, I mean, like often sometimes people try and time it so that it kind of always is, it's like a quarter note or an eighth note, whatever the, the common timing of the that pattern is on that drum kind of thing, where it's like returning just before the next hit. You know, that's a sound in itself. Um, it all depends on what you want to do. And honestly, don't be like upset if this takes you a long time to really wrap your head around. It took me a long time, that's for sure. And I still feel like I'm learning. Um it's it, compression is just like this thing that sometimes it does what you expected it to do, <laughs> and then sometimes it takes a little longer to, to get it there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I, I agree. It it definitely takes experience, but there is actually a great way to learn how to hear compression and what it does and how and what the controls do. And uh, I think it's from the book. What's the book called? Mixing with your mind. I think it's it's one of the greatest books I've ever read on mixing, and uh, it's. It, the author explains it in uh, in a way that really makes sense to me, and you can you can like follow this and try to see if 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 that it makes it more clear for you as well. Because what he says is you should um, when you want to figure out what the correct settings for a signal are, and you're not as experienced yet, you can do the following: you can set the attack time to the shortest possible attack time. You set the release time to the longest possible release time. And you set, like, to start, and then you set the threshold as high up as possible, and you set a really, really high ratio, like a limiter, the maximum ratio. So, And then you're going to bring down the threshold until the compressor starts working. You bring it down a lot so that you get a lot of compression, very fast attack, very long release, very high ratio. You bring the, the threshold down until you get a lot of compression, and then you start increasing the attack time until you hear a transient come through. And you will hear, at first you will hear a very sharp, short transient, then the transient will get fuller, louder, and at some point the transient won't change as much because you've reached an attack time where the, the transient just comes through and nothing really happens to it anymore. And then you know, like, how much of that transient do I want to get through? How much low end do I want to come through? How much attack? You can set the release time that uh, the, the attack time that way. Then you grab the release time and you shorten it and you make it so that the compressor recovers just for before the next hit as a starting point. You make sure that like if you have a drum kit, for example, a snare drum or a kick drum or whatever, or a vocal, just set the release time in a way that it's musical, that the next important mm-hmm. transient information still gets through and whatever you want to have controlled stays down. And then you're going to bring down the ratio to a point where it's not sounding like a limiter anymore but and that produces artifacts and like distortion, but like sounds reasonable and musical and then you set the threshold to take away as much as you want but you can like go through these steps and really figure out what the attack does what the release does how much you want to compress and then at what point the compressor should start acting but if you do it in this backwards way sort of it really at least for me it really helped me understand what the controls do and how i should actually set the compress time on a on a uh, other attack and release times on a signal right yeah, yeah, that that's a great exercise for sure. Um, totally encourage you all to, to to try exactly that. Just pull up audio, and and then experiment with parameters until you do hear yeah. the difference. Yeah, and set it to extremes <laughs> because it really helps to hear the extremes. Yeah. Don't don't do it in Definitely. a subtle way. Absolutely. Like set it to the extremes and see what it does. And everything else is like experience and also taste. You know, much of it is is just not right or wrong. It's just taste. Yeah, definitely. All right, we've we've hit threshold, which again was where the compressor re- thinks starts to think something is too loud. Uh, attack, and that's how quick it's going to respond um, to the technical. Yeah, the technical description being how quick it responds to the actual gain reduction that you have set, um, and then release being the speed that it returns. Um, and then makeup gain. I guess that's where we're at here. Makeup gain is so yeah. If you picture you're hitting the peaks right with the threshold with uh, your threshold, you're just hitting the peaks and it's knocking those down. And now, if you've done nothing else, it seems like your audio is quieter because you've just 
gain reduced all those peaks, right? By whatever ratio you've set it to. Now, the important thing to do is to make use makeup gain to kind of bring up the overall level to where it was before. Um, and then now when we bypass the compressor in and out, our audio sounds the same, um, the same level, ideally. That's like the goal of that. And we can actually tell if we like what we're doing to it, if we like how we're changing it, right? Absolutely. That's super important because you might think something sounds better, but it's actually worse and you don't know because it just it just got louder or quieter or whatever. Just so you have to use the makeup gain to make sure you can compare properly and also keep your gain staging the way it was and all of that. So yes. yeah, it's as the word says, like the term makeup gain, you make up for the gain you lost during compression. Yep. Now there are some compressors that don't have some of these controls. So if you ever if you've ever seen an eleven seventy six or a plug in version of that, for example, you won't find a threshold control. And that's but mm. it's the same principles apply even with those compressors or an LA two A is even simpler. Um, you don't even have attack and release controls there. But th right. the same stuff happens inside. It's just when you with a compressor like that, when there's no threshold control, if you turn up the input, you move the signal towards a set threshold. And when it reaches the, th the threshold, the compressor starts working. But it's the same thing. It's just whether you bring the threshold down or turn the signal up before it hits the threshold, it's the same thing. Um, yeah, it's not the same thing, but it there is a threshold. And when the signal goes past that, the compressor starts working. Um, it's just, you just use it in a different way, but the same stuff is happening. And when on an LA-2A, for example, you can choose between limit and compress, it's going to give you different attack and release times. Uh, it's going to make the attack shorter and the release quicker, pro probably. And um, it's just a one one click thing to change those parameters versus having to set them yourself. But yeah, right. so there's all sorts of different compressors, but inside it's it's the same thing happening. It's just different concepts. Yeah, yep. same principle going on there. Um, like Benny said, limiters are just really extreme compressors. That's what's going on there. I guess, like, hmm, I shouldn't say anything I'm going to regret, but I think transient designers are essentially more or less very similar. <laughs> there, are, there are so many different concepts at this point of transient manipulation tools that I would be careful with that. But but I believe some. Yeah. But I believe <laughs> yes, you are altering yeah. the the transient and the 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 release. So it's it's a similar process, but some like, form of attack and release. Yeah, so. yeah. But <laughs> yeah, you're changing the dynamics. It all falls into the category of of dynamics tools, basically, and. Um, that's what a compressor yeah. does. You can use a compressor like a transient designer almost, depending on how fast the compressor is, but you can definitely increase um, the attack or, or decrease it and you can change the release. So you can do similar things as with as with a transient designer. So yeah, absolutely. Definitely. So let's talk about some typical scenarios and why this is important to you, even if you don't use compression now when you record, for example, why this could be important to you. For example... If you record drums, you record a snare drum, and your drummer is not hitting very consistently or not very hard, and the mixer decides that he or she wants to get more attack out of the snare drum or wants to make it more consistent sounding. So right. they do what we just described. They set the attack and release to achieve whatever they want to achieve. They pull the threshold down. They adjust the ratio, and then they adjust the makeup gain to make up for the gain they lost. And what then happens is more loud more often, or the quieter stuff gets louder. So the hi-hat bleed or the cymbals or whatever you have in that snare drum mic as well will become louder because the snare drum is yes. louder in that mic than everything else. The snare drum will be controlled and the quiet stuff will just come up. So what that means for you is if you record a snare drum in a way that you capture a lot of that hi-hat bleed or a lot of cymbals or a lot of the room or whatever else is going on, this stuff will become more apparent now, will become louder now, and it could like, up to, to the point where you have to do something about it, to the point where you have to use samples or you have to gate it really hard or do some whatever tricks to get rid of that bleed, which will make the drum sound more unnatural and all of that. So if you want to have a lot of of your natural snare drum, or if you want to keep the drums all natural in the mix, you got to understand the concept of compression because if compression is necessary to achieve the sound and the punch you want, then you better make sure 
you control the bleed as much as you can in that mic because the bleed will become louder mm -hmm. after it gets compressed. That's one um, absolutely. one scenario where you absolutely need to know about compression. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, compressing on the way in. There are hardware compressors, uh, which are obviously very fun and cool looking, um, but usually pretty expensive. So I, I don't really expect most self-recording bands to have one, honestly. Um, so it's worth knowing that there are usually compressors in your DAW that can be tracked through in real time without actually being destructive and actually doing anything to the audio file. They're just for monitoring only. Um, so, and that's amazing. That's like, what a great way to be able to learn and experiment with compressors while recording without destroying and absolutely ruining a drum tech. Yeah. <laughs> right? So totally encourage you to, to do that um, and try and get the sound in your head using a, a DAW compressor. Just make sure it is like a, a ultra low latency one um, that's not going to add latency to the drummer trying to play. Um, but yeah, so use that. You got to really watch out for bleed. Um, we're going to talk about gates on a future episode, but that's going to be really relevant to this as well. Um, so I'm excited for that. I think vocals are the other thing that I'm like, 100% of the time, I'm going to have a compressor, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, right? Because uh, vocals are extremely dynamic instruments. They they can be really quiet or really loud. It's kind of hard to even, for the singer, I think, to self-regulate that. Um, I don't... Oh, well, maybe. I don't know. But essentially, they're more dynamic than what we want coming out of a speaker, um, usually. And when you put it in a mix with all of these loud instruments, like a distorted guitar, which is very constant and loud that vocal getting quiet might mean that you can't hear it anymore, right? So getting a compressor on a vocal is something that's extremely common. Um, and the things to watch out there is, I think consonances might be the, the worst of them. Um, if you set up your compressor wrong, you might end up with like S noises that are just insanely loud and hard to deal with. Um, and different people have different S noise characteristics yep. <laughs> some people are really prone to it i mean some people don't have any and that's a problem too um so that's like a constant thing uh, so you'll spend a lot of time dialing in the attack on the, of the compressor and the release actually um on on a vocal i usually suggest people start on a vocal with um all the way slow attack all the way fast release that's like safe starting point for uh, a compressor to do something helpful <laughs> on a vocal. Yeah, I agree. Um, you you got to know that fast release usually, at least to me, usually means it sounds more aggressive. Um, longer release sounds more controlled and even and leveled out. And if you have, for a sing with the singer, for example, a very quick release time, it's going to make the vocal jump out the speaker more. It's going to pronounce the, yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's, Imagine like the best example would be probably a rapper or some some sort of aggressive vocal where you keep the attack long enough to get all the transients through and the aggression and they, you can hear the, the singer, the, the rapper spitting, you know, and then you have the mm -hmm. fast release time so it recovers quickly and it just sounds explosive and aggressive and upfront. And that's also for rock vocals, very, very helpful. And so, yeah, great starting point there. And also, I feel it's very helpful to track with a compressor when you track vocals or at least monitor it because it makes the singer oftentimes feel much more confident because if you if you really compress it hard on the way in or at least on the monitoring, then um, it, immediately, it immediately sounds more finished, more upfront, more like a record. And the person singing, if they hear that on their headphones, they're going to feel more confident about themselves and they're going to enjoy it more versus the very, very dynamic, uncompressed signal that can sound weak to them or they might start questioning their own performance or their energy or whatever and when they hear this like pumping energetic sort of over the top voice it's going to make them more exciting you got to be careful though mm -hmm. to not ruin it if you're not know knowing what you're doing but um at least have it in the monitoring um signal it, it really helps it's just fun definitely yeah i i totally agree um yeah that those are like the two main use cases i think um, I don't always compress guitars. I don't even always compress bass in tracking. Most of the time I do, but not I always. Say. Yeah, you're right. But here's another thing why you, even if you don't do it, need to, again, know about it or, or should keep it in the back of your, your head because when you're tracking bass, for example, and you play, let's say you play with your fingers and you have some really sharp 
um, like clacking sounds in there, which some fingerstyle bassists have when they hit the pickups or they they sort of sort of some bassists pull on the strings and it makes these clacking attack noises, but not all the time, like inconsistently. If you get that, some th- some people do that with a pick as well, but like fingerstyle bass. I have had a couple of, of of tracks sent to me that had this problem, where there would be this occasional clicks and this this overall clacky sound, and when I then want to compress that to change the tone or to make it more consistent or whatever, these clicks and pops would jump out like crazy, and I would have to do something about them and control them, and this can be very tough to do, and I sometimes cannot compress as much as I would love to because of these things. So just keep in mind that. Stuff that's not as obvious while it is uncompressed might become more obvious and more of a problem after it's compressed. So, yeah. Right. That is a great thing to bring up for vocals again, actually. Um, And another reason to at least monitor a compressor is because you might think that you're recording in your kitchen and it sounds fine. But as soon as you throw a compressor on there and the, the slappy ambience of your tiled kitchen floor and backsplash and stuff gets louder right because all the quiet stuff's getting louder as we're compressing and and closer to our you know average volume it gets all of a sudden your vocal's going to sound really roomy and awful yep (laughs) um uh, probably awful i should say uh and uh, so, yeah, I, I, like that's for a self-recording band. That's one thing I think that would be really great um, is to always slam a vocal uh, and see what comes out, right? Like, does the room all of a sudden activate? And you're like, oh my God, this is like an echo chamber all of a sudden kind of thing. It wouldn't be an echo chamber, but it will, you'll hear that room sound. Um, it's hard to describe. You'll, you'll hear it. That, that would be a wise Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm always yeah. surprised how much like how loud the room actually gets i have a very very controlled uh, tracking room and it's it's small but it's very very controlled and dry and still if i really slam a vocal if i still compress it hard the vocal that's been tracked at my studio i can still hear that room and i'm always surprised because when you're in that room it's it feels dead it feels really really dead and i'm always surprised mm-hmm. about like how roomy it can become after it's compressed and limited and distorted and whatever so uh yeah, yeah. do that test and add like Think of that scenario of, with your like tiled kitchen floor and and everything, and add to the slapback, add to that like your overly sibilant voice maybe that you haven't realized you have. Um, then it, you're really starting to have a problem because then the S's are louder than you thought they would be. The slap delay or the the echo, the reverb is louder than you thought it was, and all of a sudden you end up with a like mostly unusable vocal that sounded fine yeah. to you and you didn't even notice, but. Yeah. 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 If you listen to podcasts that aren't recorded by us two, you probably hear this all the time. Yes. <laughs> if, like uh, pretty much people that aren't either uh, successful enough, like, like Rogan's podcast sounds pretty great because he's got an audio engineer like literally in the room with him um, and other people do as well. But a lot of people starting out just, you know, grab a USB mic, plop it down in their living room and then you're like, wow, this is pretty terrible sounding. <laughs> yep. That's uh, that's kind of the sound we're describing. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, cool. Um, I mean, that's that's a lot to um, to process yeah. already, like for you probably. And I, I'm I need to come up with a way. I need to put something in the show notes that makes this easier to understand and to visualize. So if you go to the show notes of this episode, which is the selfrecordingband.com slash sixty one, you'll find additional info on this. Um, and I try to make it as as easy for you as possible. And then I think the most important thing is just using what you've learned now and trying to and just experimenting, trying to learn what that stuff sounds like, uh, trying to, to train your ears to hear compression, to know what the controls do. It's a lot of experimenting and you'll get there pretty quickly if you do those exercises a, 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 for a bit. It's like it's, it's will, It will become obvious to you now that you know what the basic controls do. Just experiment. That's all I can yeah. say, basically. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because there there is more. Um, like there, There's more functions on some compressors than others and stuff like that. And stuff that, you know, is important and I use every time, but uh, until you've got this stuff down, it's totally irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. Also, like what, probably the last thing I wanted to, I want to add here is when you are getting a mix or a master back and you feel like it sounds flat or it sounds not exciting anymore and you don't really know what happens and you, you're having a hard time describing to the engineer what is wrong, it could be that it's just over-compressed. It's just that the transients 
the peaks are not there anymore. And that's that's because, and that's what makes it sound lifeless to you. Maybe there was a very punchy snare drum and after mastering, the snare drum was gone. Or maybe there were like exciting vocal transients and consonants and now it sounds all flat. Or maybe like all these things, maybe there was a big full bass drum and now the low end is gone. And it's not because they took out the low end with an EQ. It's because maybe they compressed it very hard with a short attack time or they used the limiter very hard. And now the all the low end is being controlled and probably distorted by the compressor. So now that you know what a compressor can do, next time you get something back and you feel like it's not what it should be, maybe you now have the vocabulary to explain to the engineer what's wrong. And the opposite could be true as well. Maybe you want it more dense, more energetic. Maybe something like chumps out too much and you want to have it more controlled and you can tell the engineer, hey, I got this overly dynamic whatever, can you control that a little more? I have too much transients in here or whatever. Just, um, I think it helps you communicate better and uh, mm-hmm. n- maybe get to the reason for a certain problem faster. Right. Yeah. Yeah, great point. All right. All right. I think that's a wrap. I think so. Go play with compressors, guys. Exactly. And guys. Okay, then... Uh, once again, join the Facebook community, selfrecordingband.com slash community. And we'll see you next week with another episode. See you then.